Strangers are welcomed, lost are found. Community grows strong and lives are transformed. Widows are cared for, the hungry are fed. The sick are healed and burdens are lifted. Hope grows, giants fall. Generations are blessed and God's kingdom comes when one person says yes. Well, hello again, church. If I haven't met you before, my name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ the King. And this week I've been looking at underdog stories. And there's something about the underdog story that resonates deeply with the heart of humanity. I mean, we all love a good underdog story, don't we? Who in here likes Rocky? Anybody? A Rocky fan? Beautiful. We've got Rocky Balboa picking a fight against the charismatic world champion Apollo Creed. And he shows that with enough heart, unwavering determination, and a good training montage, even you can defy the odds and become a champion. Or maybe for you at Star Wars, any Star Wars people in the house, beautiful, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, a young Luke Skywalker sets out on a hero's journey only to accidentally kiss his sister, fight his dad, and ultimately destroy the Death Star. We know the story, don't we? Or maybe it's the greatest underdog story ever told, the 96 Pinewood Derby in Cordova, Alaska. You know this, right? You know the, the, the Pinewood Derby story. For those of you who don't, for too long, the upperclassmen had dominated the circuit, but in 96, a new challenger emerged and a new story was written. That's right, my friends, my dad and I put excuses aside and went to work crafting the most pristine car the Cordova Pinewood Derby community had ever seen. We obsessed over every detail and made sure it was just right. And on race night, one by one, the other cars fell under the weight of this beautiful vehicle. In the finals, it felt like time stood still and down the track, the two cars went like a scene out of the fast and the furious. And even though they said it couldn't be done, it was done. And a young Brian Barron etched his name among the greats of the local Boy Scout racing community. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And all God's people said amen. And amen, it's the underdog story. It's the dark horse. It's the Cinderella story. It's the comeback hit. It's the against all odds he overcame story that resonates deeply in our hearts because it makes us believe that maybe if they could do it, we could do it too. And friends, perhaps no story has captured the heart of humanity quite like the story we're going to talk about today. It's the story of David and Goliath. Friends, this is the name brand of underdog stories. This is top shelf. This is the symbol of any story about someone or something impossibly small taking on and overcoming an adversity that feels impossibly big. You can't make it through a single year of watching March Madness without the commentators mentioning David and Goliath when the 15 seed beats the three or the two or the 14 beats the, the, the three. That's just how it goes. This is a part of the cultural vernacular. They say it was a David versus Goliath story. So this isn't just something we say in church. This is something that's permeated our culture. This is a story that helps us believe that what Mark Twain said is true, that it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight and the dog. And in all these stories, one thing is true. There's an underdog who has to say yes, because friends, before, us to ever, before we ever have the courage to win, we have to have the courage to stand in the ring and say yes. And right now we're in the middle of a series called When One Person Says Yes, and we're exploring what God can do when we give him our yes. And our hypothesis is this. It's that so much of life is decided not by, based on your ability to be exceptional, but rather by your ability to say yes when the moment calls. And right now we're going to get into the David and Goliath story, but before we do, I want to prepare our hearts and pray. So will you bow your heads with me? Holy Spirit. We pray that you would move in power. God, we know that you are the hero of our story. And so, God, would you show us what it looks like to have courage because we know that you are on our side. God, that you are fighting our battles. God, that you go before and you are behind and you are on our left and our right. You are above and below. God, you are in every single detail. And Jesus, today we just pray that you would reveal a little bit more of yourself to us a little bit more of your love, a little bit more of your power, because I'm convinced that to the degree that we understand who you are and your love for us, God, that's the degree that we are transformed. And God, that is our heart. God, that we leave this place changed. 
God, that we would leave this place with a newfound courage that doesn't come from us, that doesn't come from uh, self-help, God, but that comes from the ultimate helper, God, which is you and your spirit. So God, give us boldness to hear and to listen to what it is that you have for us today. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. I want to start with a quote. Ian McLaren once said, be kind for everyone is fighting a battle that you know nothing about. Be kind because everybody is fighting a battle you know nothing about. What does this mean? This means that every person on Instagram whose life looks perfect has a battle that you know nothing about. But it means that every person standing on a stage with a microphone has a battle you know nothing about. What this means is every person you admire has a battle that you know nothing about. What this means is that every person in this room has a battle that you know nothing about and every person online as well. And what I'm hoping that we can do today through this story is to really frame and gain some wisdom into how we are called to fight our battles as a people of faith. And what I want to do is simple. I want to walk through the David and Goliath story piece by piece. And along the way, I have three questions that I want to ask you. Here's the first. What is your battle? Friends, what is the thing that you are up against today? I actually want you to call it to your mind so that as we read and as we explore the story, it can actually um, speak to you because this isn't just a David's story. This is actually our story too. What is your battle? Because when we look at the David and Goliath story, the first thing that we learn about is the battle at hand. We learn about the adversary. Immediately we find out that the Philistine army has invaded Israel and there's a standoff taking place between these two armies. In verse 4, we read that a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. And the word champion, it says a champion named Goliath. That word is interesting because it's the only place in all the scripture where it gets used. It's actually the combination of two words. It's man and between. So what it's saying is that a man has imposed himself between these two armies. He has come out from his army and he's now standing in the middle. And scripture says this. It says his height was six cubits and a span. And so it says, this is a big dude. This is not a normal sized enemy. This is a large enemy. It doesn't just say large. It actually gives us the numbers. It says six cubits and a span. Just for context, a cubit is somewhere in the range of 18 inches and a span is uh, how far it is from your, your pinky over here to your thumb over here when you hold your hand out like this. this is a span. So six cubits and a span. And according to those measurements, it means that Goliath stood at over nine feet tall. So he was no ordinary man. He was a giant. He was big. And just to give you a little context into what this might look like uh, standing next to, to somebody that you're familiar with, let's throw the picture up here. <laughs> so this is uh, Shaquille O'Neal, seven foot one, probably 340, 360, I don't know. And, uh, and this is uh, clearly Photoshopped. This is actually Pitbull's body, but we put Grant's face on it just uh, <laughs> so it'd be a little bit more familiar for you, but uh, well, what I'm saying is this is a big boy right here. Shaq is a big boy. Now let's throw the next picture up. This is Shaq next to Robert Wadlow. Robert Wadlow, this is uh, one of those wax museums, and this is his actual size, um, and he was the tallest man in recorded history. He's eight foot 11, right at that nine foot place. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that Grant is average size, Shaq is much bigger, and Robert Wadlow is much bigger than Shaq. And Goliath would be even bigger than Robert Wadlow, only unlike Robert Wadlow, he wouldn't look like he's going to the spelling bee, he looks like he's going to war. This is a serious, serious dude. Scripture says that Goliath had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. So translation, Goliath is huge and not only is he huge, he's covered in the finest and thickest armor known to man. His armor in and of itself weighed 125 pounds and the tip of his spear, not his spear, but the tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds by itself. So here's what the Bible wants you to know about this adversary. It's bigger than you, he's stronger than you, he's better resourced than you, and he is standing in the middle. And as he stands, he shouts at the Israelite army and he says, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? So choose a man and have him come down to me. 
If he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. So the second thing we learn is the challenge that Goliath is giving. Goliath isn't inviting them into a typical battle. He's inviting them into a battle of representation. He says, I'll represent my army, and you can represent your army. Find somebody from your ranks to come and fight me. We don't all need to shed our blood. We can just have one battle. We're going to do this old school 1v1, and if I win, my whole team wins, and if you win, your whole team wins. And so this is high risk, high reward. And when he's done explaining this proposition, he curses the God of Israel. And when the Israelites hear the words of this giant, the Bible said they were terrified. I looked up the word terrified in the original Hebrew, and it means terrified. (laughs) And every synonym of terrified that there is, they were shaking in their boots. And let's be honest, they had good reason to be. Because if you think about it, The first barrier before them is a literal giant, bigger than Robert Wadlow. He is someone whose size and skill were unmatched, so in and of itself, fighting a giant is pretty scary. So that's the first variable, but it's not the only one. Because what's unique about this particular type of combat is that there's two literal armies who would be watching from either side. So this wasn't a typical battle. This was more like a spectator sport. Your loss would be seen by all your peers and enemies alike. So if you get stage fright, this was not the battle for you. So we've got a big giant. That's pretty scary. And then we've got two literal armies who would be watching your every move. That's also something that would make some people cower in fear. But perhaps the scariest variable of all is the repercussions of this battle because it's a representative battle. So if you die, it's not just that you die, it's that your death would be a death sentence to everyone that you hold dear. If you lose, your loss would be shared by your family and your friends. So it's not just that these soldiers are scared to die, friends, it's that they're afraid to fail on behalf of their entire nation. Their death means death for their whole team. And for 40 days and for 40 nights, Goliath cursed the God of Israel and invited someone forward, a champion brave enough to face him. And every time he did, all the soldiers, including the king, would cower in fear. And this is the stage that gets set in David versus Goliath. This is what David was walking into. Onto this stage comes a hero, but... Like all good stories, the hero doesn't look the way that we thought that he would look. The Bible says that there's a small shepherd boy named David who's from Bethlehem. Remember this. He's from Bethlehem who gets sent to the battlefield. And hear this, friends. Here's why he's going to the battlefield. He's going to bring bread to his brothers, and he's there to bring cheese to the commander. Bread for the brothers, cheese for the commander. Do you guys know about the cheese in this story? Friends, I'm not making this stuff up. Your Bible literally says David's dad, Jesse, asked him to bring 10 types of cheeses to the chief. And so here's what I'm trying to say. To be clear, David isn't heading to the battlefield to challenge the champion. He's there to bring a charcuterie board of cheeses to the chief. He's on a cheese running errand. This is what David is doing. He's going to the battlefield bringing his brie for Saul. That's what he's there to do. But when he arrives at the battlefield, he happens to overhear this challenger and his challenge. He hears Goliath curses God, and the story shifts because instead of cowering in fear, David brings forth a question. In verse 26, he says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Talk about an epic entrance. Our hero David has come to play. He says, why is everyone cowering in fear? And by the way, who is this thug who defies the living God? Friends, this is what the Bible wants you to know about David. He's got heart and he came to the battlefield with Havarti. <laughs> he's got courage and he's got cheddar for the chief. One more. He looks like a shepherd boy, but your boy's got brie for the boss. <laughs> this is David. Eventually, David gets brought before Saul and wastes no time volunteering for duty. Verse 32 says, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. It says, If nobody else will, I will. 
David says, yes, it's like Hunger Games. He says, I volunteer as tribute. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to go. He says, if nobody else is going to fight this fight, let me do it. And for a moment, it looks like there's going to be a battle on our hands. But as soon as David says yes, Saul says no. Verse 33 says, you are not able to go against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he's been a warrior since his youth. So translation, Saul says, absolutely not. And he gives two reasons. He says, David, you're too small and you're too inexperienced. Just by looking at him, Saul formulates a list of reasons why David can't be the answer to the problem that they're facing. He looks at David and he doesn't see a warrior. He sees an errand boy sent by his daddy to bring him brie cheese. He doesn't see an answer. He sees excuses. And it's funny because this is exactly what you and I do. We love coming up with reasons why God can't use people. Some of you in here are sitting here thinking, man, I'm not good at anything, but I'm telling you, you're actually really, really good at formulating long lists of reasons why God can't use you. You're very, very, very good at coming up with excuses for, well, God couldn't use me because, and those excuses keep you on the si sideline. Here's Saul's excuse. He says, this problem's too big, and David, you're too small. So here's my second question. What's your excuse today? First question, what's your battle? What are you facing? Second question, what's your excuse? What's the story that you're telling? What's the narrative that you're spinning in your heart that is keeping you from facing the thing in front of you? Because if David and Goliath teaches us anything, it's that God doesn't call the qualified friends. He qualifies the called. Now, I don't know who this is for, but I feel like God sent me here to say that you are not too small. You are not too broken. You are not disqualified. It actually doesn't take somebody being remarkable to be used by God. It takes somebody saying yes. This is what God invites us into, availability. He's not looking for somebody exceptional. He's just looking for somebody who has the ability to say, use me. David says yes, and even though Saul says no, he keeps moving forward. You know, oftentimes we say, well, if we're going to be obedient to God, then that probably means the doors are going to open. Not the case here. He says, let me go, and Saul says no. But he pushes on anyway because this is the destiny God has called him into. He says, I might not look like a warrior to you, but God's given me everything I need for this battle. He said, out in the wilderness, I took down lions and I took down bears, and if you let me fight, this giant will fall just like they did. Eventually, Saul says yes, but he tries to put his own armor on David, and it doesn't fit. It only weighs him down. So David says, I can't do it your way. I'm not going to fight the giant the way that you would. I'm actually going to do it the way I was created to. If I'm going to go into this fight, I need to do it the way that God created me. And in the quintessential moment, David takes his staff into his hand and chooses five smooth stones from the stream and puts them in his pouch. And with a sling in his hand, scripture says he approached the Philistine. But before they battle with weapons, they battle with words. When Goliath sees David, he's literally offended. He says, what am I, a dog, that you come at me with sticks? And he curses David by his gods and says, come here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. This is PG-13 stuff, friends. Then David responds, and he rebuttals, and he says, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of armies of Israel, who you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. And here's what I want you to see. Goliath feels underestimated by David. He says, what am I, a dog, that you come at me with a stick? You sent the cheese boy out to fight the battle. Do you not see what you're facing? But then David says, it's not me who underestimates you, it's you who underestimates me. Because you think this battle is going to be won by swords and spears and javelins, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. And when David addresses Goliath, I want you to notice he mentions God seven times in his speech, which is important because seven is the number of... God, it also is the number of completion. 
So what David's saying is, you might think this is your battle, but I know it's not your battle. It's not even my battle. It's God's battle, and he is completely in control. We get to the fight in verse 48. It says, as the Philistine moved closer to attack, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David then ran and stood over him, took the Philistine's sword and drew it in his sheath. And after he killed him, he cut off his head with his very own sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. And this is the story of David and Goliath against all odds. A small shepherd boy from Bethlehem strikes down a giant from Gath. And since he didn't have a sword of his own, he used Goliath's own sword to cut off his head, which means that the very tool that was meant to kill David was the tool that God used to secure his victory. And I've heard so many sermons on David and Goliath, and man, I, I love them. I, I love the underdog story, and they usually end with the preacher getting all excited and giving what sounds like a pump-up speech straight out of Braveheart. <laughs> Say, you got to face your giants, and you need to fight you need to pick up five stones. Usually the five stones represent virtues of a champion. And then you need precision in your aim. And you need courage in your heart. And you need to strike and strike and strike until that giant's in the ground for good. Got to be like David. You got to fight your giants in front of you. And it's not a bad application. I, I, I don't mind it myself, but it does feel a little incomplete to me. It feels like a version of what I would call the Nike gospel, which is just do it. Just be braver. Just be stronger. Just be better. Just kill the thing in your life that seems unkillable. And it makes a great conclusion. Really, it does. It leaves people feeling like they could punch through a wall. That's all great and good, but the only problem is that in life, I don't know if you've seen this, but when you try and punch through a wall, a lot of times the wall punches back. And oftentimes when we take a shot at a giant, the giant takes a shot at us. Friends, here's the truth. There are some giants in your life that you're going to face that you are helpless to fight on your own. There are some giants that won't fall even when you throw rocks. There are some issues that you will deal with in your life that can't be solved by yourself no matter how many how-to videos you watch on YouTube. Because no matter how much victory we have in Christ on this side of eternity, there will always be moments and battles that leave us shaking in our boots. That's what it means to be a human. But friends, here is the good news. Into the middle of the moments of our fear and our failure, into the middle of the moments we can't win because we're outsized and outskilled and outnumbered, God doesn't send a pump up speech. He doesn't send, send brave heart. He doesn't say, try harder and be better and kill the giant that's towering over you. I was listening to a message from a pastor named Ben Stewart, and he put it this way He said, Into the middle of your battle, God doesn't send a cheerleader, He sends a substitute, He sends a champion. He sends a man to stand between who said, I'll step out for you. I'll fight for you. I'll do what you could never do. Friends, I'm here to tell you that this is the good news of the gospel. And yes, this story's about David, but the bigger story that's being pointed to here is that one day out of a little town called Bethlehem, God would send a son of David as a representative for you and for me. And because there was a great giant named Sin that no one could fight, there was an adversary that no one could put in the ground, no matter how many stones they picked up. And while we were shaking in our boots, not knowing what to do, Jesus, the champion, said, well, if no one else is going to take this thing out I guess I'll do it and he came down and here's the good part he said when I put this giant in the ground it won't just be my victory it'll be victory for anyone who calls upon my name friends I need you to know that Jesus died for you but he didn't stay dead he defeated death hell and the grave and the very thing that was meant to end Jesus life in his death was actually the thing he overcame and ended up using to extend life to you like the sword that cut off July's head. Literally the thing that was meant to end Jesus was the thing he extended to us and said, you can have life, and not just life, but life to the full. 
And friends, this is the story of David and Goliath because you and I love a good underdog story, but the reality is oftentimes in life, we're more like the Israelites than we are like David. Oftentimes we're more fearful than uh, we are courageous in those moments. And the good and bigger story that's at play here is that even in the moments where we're frozen in fear, our God still sends down a champion on our behalf to fight. And when he gets the victory, friends, because this is a representative battle, we get his victory. We get to experience what he has done for us. Friends, this month is all about giving God our yes. And I want you to know that your yes should always come from a place of response of knowing what God's yes was for you. And any gift that you're invited to take and any gift that you're invited to give comes from a place and from a response of knowing the gift that God gave to you. Because he's the hero of our story and it's our incredible privilege to get to join him in sharing his victory with the world. And right now we're in the middle of missions month, which is one of my favorite months, not because of all the cool stuff that we get to do in the world, but because of what doing that stuff actually does in our hearts. When we look outside of our normal uh, life and we see all the ways that God is moving throughout the world, it actually does something beautiful in our hearts. We get to taste and see that the Lord is good in so many ways. And as we close, I want to highlight one project that our kids are championing right now. Our kids are working on a goal that feels like a giant. They're trying to raise $500 so that kids in the Kybera slums can actually have bananas at lunch. And Grant told me the story of the first time he went to Africa or one of the, the first times he actually saw these kids and they got bananas and they opened it up and they just nibbled a little bit off the top and then they put it away and wrapped it up. And, and Grant was asking around. He said, what, what's going on? Why aren't they eating their bananas? They're saying they're actually bringing them back home so that they can share them with their family. And what I'm trying to to, to share with you is a banana. You might think, what's the big deal? For them, it's a big deal. These aren't just growing on trees there in a slum. They haven't even seen a banana tree, a lot of them, in their life. And when they get bananas, they don't just say thank you. They literally have dance parties. And right now, we're actually going to watch a video of one of those dance parties that Brian and Tracy got to film and see. And so let's watch this together and see what our kids are going to be bringing to the other side of the world. Let's watch it now. that amazing so that's what our kids are working on they're raising 500 bucks so that kids in the Kybera slums can have some dance parties and eat some bananas and uh, that's just one of the eight different projects we're going to be working on this year there's actually a a slide that we're going to show up here and so that we can see the other projects Uh, we're doing something called feed the 5,000 Um, We're doing 10 homes for widows, and you can see uh, the beautiful uh, home that was created out in the comments so that you can see a context of what that would look like. We've got 10 medical clinics that we're trying to fund for $35,000. We've got 25 teacher gifts for $6,000, two school buildings for $51,000, and a youth leadership camp in Israel for $15,000. And so the kids are doing the bananas. My question is this, at the end of seeing the battle that God has won for you, what's the yes that you're going to give him? I wonder if you wrestle with God and you look at all that he's given you, if God might be inviting you to invest into one of these projects today. That's my final question. What's your yes? What's the yes God's inviting you into today?
And if you want to learn more about these projects, there's these beautiful booklets, and uh, inside the booklet you can see a breakdown of not just what the projects are, but a little bit of context into what they're going to look like and how they're going to feel. And so I would just encourage you to actually check this out and to, to wrestle and say, God, what's the yes that you're inviting me into this year because you have been so faithful? And so as we close today, we're actually going to go into a moment of giving, and we're going to respond in song, and we're going to sing together. And just to, to share our heart a little bit, when it comes to Missions Month, Missions Month is a way that we give that's above and beyond. So this is for those of you who are already investing in the financial fabric of CTK and God's calling you to give beyond what you're already giving. And if that's you, there's a couple different ways that you can give. Uh, there's these blue envelopes, which are going to be in the back of uh, the room here. And then you can also go to give.ctk.church, and you can go to the Missions Project 2024 on the drop-down. And so if God's inviting you into one of these projects, which I pray and hope that he is, that's the way that you can give to missions. And as we close today, though, uh, I actually want to wrap up by giving back to God our tithes and our offerings. This is something that we love to do. Um, and if you're visiting with us, we want you to know uh, that we don't want anything from you. The fact that you're here is such a gift to us. But if this is your church, uh, this is a way that we get to be generous. And this is a way that we get to invest into what God is doing here. And so you can do so by going to give.ctk.church, and then there's two other options. There's drop boxes at the back of this room, and then we're also uh, going to be doing something that we've been doing, again, for the last four weeks. We're going to be passing baskets through this room. And uh, we, we brought this back after three years, and it's important to say we didn't do this because we wanted to. People actually asked us. They said, we want a moment in service where we can have a tangible reminder of all the ways that God has given to us. And so as that basket comes around, that's our actual hope for that moment, is for you to be reminded of all that God's given you, and maybe it prompts in your heart what you can give to God. And so we haven't done it in three years, and what we found is that we are wildly out of practice at handing baskets around this room. So I'm going to give you a little bit of context, do my best to make sure that this goes as swimmingly as possible. The baskets are going to start at the back of the room, they're going to work their way towards the front, and they're going to be working from uh, your right to your left. I really had to think about that. Your right to your left. And so we are not passing buckets forward or backward, just from your right to your left. And so if there's a couple seats in between you and the next person, please kindly bring it over. And then here's the distinction I want to make clear. We're going to have ushers that are picking up baskets in the middle and over on the far wall over here. So what that means is that if you're over here and the bucket gets to you, you can just hold on to it and the ushers are going to come and they're going to grab it. But if you are over here, in this aisle, and if you are over here, what that means is that we are extending an offer to you to actually walk that bucket across and make sure that your brother or sister on the other aisle, uh, on the other side of the aisle, receives that basket. So here and here, we're walking it across, here and over there, we're holding it, and the ushers will come, and they will uh, grab it for you. And uh, Grant also told me to say this, if you're thinking about leaving early, don't. Uh, we're actually responding with a song. It's one of my favorites. It's called Same God. And uh, it's got this lyric in here that says, uh, we're calling on the God of David who made a shepherd boy courageous. And it's talking about how, God, we need you, and you are the same God today, yesterday, and forever. So there's a bunch of stories in the song. What I need you to know is God is faithful. He's faithful today. He was faithful yesterday, and he'll be faithful tomorrow. So as that basket gets to you, um, when you pass it, you can stand and you can worship with us today. So ushers, uh, when you're ready, please uh, release the baskets among us and we will sing and worship together. Let's worship. <laughs> 